Okay. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Um, today you're gonna have uh, Udo Fowder, soon to be uh, postdoc at Unicamp, coming from London. Um, he's gonna tell us about his quaternion Kila metrics on bundles over hyperkila manifolds and the symmetries. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Udav. Just uh, you're going to find if you're new to the seminar, you're going to find soon on the chat the instructions to join our mailing list, our WhatsApp advertisement group. There it is, and you might as well check our previously recorded talks on our YouTube channel. Yeah, no, no, I, I am subscribed and I do check out the the videos quite regularly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're, yes, they're quite so popular in the long run. Yeah, it's a, like they get yes. more citations than I do. <laughs> yeah, ahead. but unfortunately, it's six o'clock over here, so sometimes I can't really attend at this time. That's why. So sure. I watch it. Okay. Okay. Cool. So let me just get started. So so let me begin by telling you what is this talk about. So this talk is about uh, describing certain examples of quaternion killer metrics, which occur on bundles of hyper killer manifolds, and discuss some of the symmetries. And by uh, symmetries here, uh, I mean killing vector fields on this basis. So the way this talk is going to be structured is first I'm going to give you some basic material, a quick crash course into quaternion killer geometry, so everyone knows what this is I'm talking about. Then I'm going to move on to the actual construction of this matrix, which is going to be fairly straightforward. And most of the time is really going to be spent on understanding the symmetries of this example. And towards the end of the talk, I will talk about some other interesting metrics which also occur on these bundles of a high pillar manifolds. And these are going to be balanced Hermitian metrics and some other special Hori metrics. And every, everything I say today in this talk is going to be based on this archive reference here. OK, and uh, what else? Uh, so feel free to interrupt me when I'm talking, because you know, if anything is not clear. Otherwise, I'll tend to go too false. OK, so let me just get started. So first thing first. Uh, we're talking about hypercular manifolds. So what are these? So these are Riemannian manifolds of dimension 4n, which have a triple of complex structures, i1, i2, and i3, that behave like the imagine, imaginary quaternion. So you know, so i1 composed with i2 is i3 plus cyclical, a cyclic permutation of this case. And this data here is called a hypercular manifold if the associated two form, this is by pairing the metric and the complex structure, the two form is currently consistent with respect to the level shifter connection. And a neat way of characterizing the same thing is to say that the lin high tensor of the complex structure vanishes and the two form is closed. And uh, a more sort of economic way of saying the same thing is just saying that the holonomic group of the underlying metric is contained inside SPN, so compact symplectic group. So this is fairly well known. And uh, sort of basic examples I want you to have in mind are the flat space. So HN here is a quaternic space. This is just uh, R4n with its flat metric. And this has holonomy group Z identity, so it's trivially a high scalar manifold. If you want to find non trivial example, then you then this, uh, you can look at the cotangent bundle of CPN. So this admits a hyperkiller metric by, Yas, by the Calabianza. So this is one of the first examples of a hyperkiller metric that was known. And both of these examples here are non compact. If you would like to find compact examples, then you can look at something like KFE surfaces. So these are Kahler, compact Kahler manifolds, which are going dimension four with vanishing first term class. And by Yau's proof of the Calabi conjecture, we know that these are Calabi manifolds, which in dimension four means that they are hyper-Kahler. OK, so you probably all know that, but maybe not everyone is familiar with quaternion Kahler geometry. So quaternion Kahler manifolds are also reminded manifolds which occur in dimensions multiple of four. And these have an underlying uh, Four form that defines the underlying structure, the current structure. So this is defined as follows. So you want that locally on your manifold, an open set, you can choose a triple of complex structure of almost complex structures, I1, I2, I3, which behave like the imaginary quaternions. Again, and the four form is defined by the following expression here. So it is the sum of the squares of the associated two form. So this simply means you know you take omega one which with omega one. And you want this four form here to be globally well defined, although you only require uh, the the two forms to be locally to be locally well defined, okay, and uh, the the current killer conditions come from a, from a certain first order PD. Just like in the hypercalar case, we have that the two forms need to be currently constant. In this case, you want your four form to be parallel. 
and uh, you would like to have a, a simple way of characterizing this this condition like just like in the hypercalculate case you had this condition here which was equivalent to asking the two form to be covariantly constant there's an equivalent way in the quaternion scalar realm and this was this is the theorem of uh, swan uh, back in uh, 1991 in his thesis work he showed that uh, the quaternion scalar four form is currently constant if and only if it is closed and in dimension eight you require this further condition here that the differential ideal generated by this triple omega one omega two omega three is in fact an algebraic ideal so concretely in dimension eight what it is saying is that you want like if you take d of omega one you want that to exist one forms such that this is equal to theta one, one three omega one, plus theta two, one omega two, plus theta three, one three omega three. And you only require this in dimension eight. In dimension more than eight, this condition is trivial, is automatically satisfied if your four form is closed. So if you're familiar with spin seven geometry, then you will know that the spin seven four form is parallel if and only if it is closed. So it is a very sort of similar condition here. And uh, an econ a very sort of simple way of Defining quaternion scalar manifold is just saying that the holomic group is contained inside SP and SP1. Okay, and so the SP1 here is really coming from the fact that this uh, this is not zero. The, the, the two forms are not closed. Okay, so basic examples one have in mind when we talk about quaternion scalar manifolds are the quaternion projective space, so HPN, and this is a symmetric space. It it's a symmetric space, and it has a non-compact dual, and the non-compact dual is what I'm going to call the hyperbolic quaternionic space okay so this is not compact and more generally uh, symmetric spaces of the form gh where h here has can be written as k cross sp1 modulus z2 this these are known as wolf spaces these are examples of quaternionic scalar manifolds okay so here this is a subgroup of spn sp1 okay and uh, but and, and you can see that this is definitely Quaternion scalar because this is the whole group of a symmetric space. Okay, so so why do we care about quaternion scalar manifolds? So one of the main reasons we care about hyperscalar manifolds is that they are rich flat. So this is one of the main reasons why we care about these objects. Uh, by contrast, quaternion scalar manifolds are not rich flat, but they are but they are Einstein. So Ricci is equal to lambda g, and lambda the scalar curvature can either be positive or negative. For instance, in this case here. This is positive, and in this case here, this is negative. Okay. So, any questions so far? Probably not. Okay. So let me move on. So you might wonder what is the difference between the positive and the negative case. Well, here are some classical results by uh, by Bon Salmon and Le Bon Salmon. So Le Bon Salmon back in 1994 uh, showed that in fact in every single uh, in dimension, there can only be finitely many positive scalar curvature quaternion scalar manifolds. And Poon and Salomon uh, previously had shown that in dimension eight, in fact, there are only three examples, and these are in fact symmetric spaces. So these are HP2, G2 over C4, and the complex cross minion of two planes in C4. Uh, more generally, uh, what is known as the Lebo Salomon conjecture asserts that in fact, uh, symmetric spaces are the only examples of positive scalar curvature quaternion scalar metrics, which are complete. Okay, so compact. Uh, compact examples of positive cutting killer manifolds are only symmetric spaces. And I believe uh, so far this conjecture has been proven to dimension 16, maybe even higher, I'm not sure. Uh, so you might wonder, well, what about the negative scalar curvature case? Well, it turns out the negative scalar curvature case is, is very different. In fact, a, a, a result of Lebois shows that, in fact, you can deform the negative cutting killer metric on the hyperbolic cutting space. To produce, you can deform it to produce infinitely many examples of complete quaternion scalar metrics. So this is saying that whereas in the in the positive case the moduli space is finite, is discrete, over here the moduli space can be infinite. That can be infinite. So basically, what Lebois shows that is that if you pick certain small sections of certain uh, holomorphic bundles over the twister space of a quaternion scalar manifold, then you can deform it to produce many examples of complete metrics. And it was previously also known by work of Alex Sivisky back in 68 and 70 that there are many examples of negative scalar curvature quaternion scalar manifolds on uh, solvable Lie groups. Okay. Okay. So that's that. 
Now, a basic ingredient that goes with a Kraken Kena Mindful is a Swan Bundle. So what is it? Uh, so, so suppose I give you a Kraken Kena Mindful, then you know that the Holomy group is contained inside SPNSP1. So this is a rich, the Holomy Bundle. Now, you can construct associated bundles by looking at representation of the Holomy group. So for instance, you could distinguish this SP1 inside SP and SP1 and look at representation of this factor. Now, SPN has a natural representation on H, uh, but the problem is that in, in this definition of the holonomic group, there's a Z2 involution that you have to mod out by. There's this Z2 ambiguity. So in order to get a well-defined action, you have to mod out your space by Z2. Then you get a fixed point. So if you want something smooth, you better take away the origin. So if you do that, then you get a, a nice representation of SPN, so, uh, SP1. So really, you should think of it as a representation of SO3 on the space. And then you can make the associated bundle construction. And you get the swan bundle. So, so what you should really think of, you should really think of the swan bundle as being essentially an awful bundle over your cutting killer manifold. Okay, so this is what is known as a swan bundle. Now, by construction, the swan bundle, denoted like this, has locally an SPN plus one structure. So where does this come from? Well, there is a cutting killer manifold. Locally, you can pick a triple of two forms omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, so you get locally an SPN structure, OK? And the fiber essentially is H, which has an SP1 structure. So it's trivially so just flat space, it's fiber-wise. So it has an SP1 structure. So the product of these two groups is surely contained inside SPN, SP1, SPN plus 1, sorry. So it has an SP1, SPN plus 1 structure, OK? So basically what Swan shows that is that if you look at the total space, UN, you can pull back the metric from the base. So this is the base. This is a fiber, the fiber, which is essentially H, or if you want R4. You can, you can define a metric on this space as follows. So you think of R4 as being R plus cross S3. You just decompose that into spherical coordinates. And then you can make a metric on that for your, for your on the total space, on the Swan space. So basically, you can take some function. So you can call the coordinate on this factor here R. And you could look at some function er square gn plus pr square gs3 plus dr square. So basically, uh, what Swan does is he makes an ansatz for the metric. He says, let's rescale the horizontal space by this function a, a, a r, and rescale the vertical space by this function b here. So this gives you a family of SPN plus one structure. So this is the associated metric. And you can solve for the condition that the associated four form to this space is to this metric is in fact zero. Okay. When he does that, he solves the equation and shows that in fact, if your base space has positive scalar curvature, then your swan space has a hyperkiller metric, a conical one, but also a positive scalar curvature cutting killer metric. Okay. So this so, so this is the fundamental result. And here's a very basic so the prototype for this example is if you start with uh, the cotton kilo projective space, HPN, then its one space turns out to be the flat space of one dimension higher, one cotton dimension higher, and its uh, positive cotton kilo metric turns out to be the compactification of the space. OK, so here's a simple example to have in mind. If you start in the n is equal to one case, then HP1 is simply S4, and the Swan space with the flat metric, the hypercalar metric, is R8. So this is H2. This is this space here. And what you should think of R8 as being R plus cross S7. And this S7 admits a half vibration over S4. And uh, this R plus here is really the R plus inside this H here. And the S3 is really inside the space. So this is essentially R plus cross S3. This is a fiber in this case. And if you compactify the space by adding an HP1 at infinity, you get HP2. OK, so this is essentially what you should have in mind. OK, and the reasons why it's conical metric is you can see over here, this is a cone over the free Sasakian space S7. And this is more generally true whenever you replace this guy here with any positive scalar curvature cutting scalar metric. OK, any questions at this point? Yeah. Uh, yes. Why, 
how exactly do you get the uh, the the role of the um, of the scalar curvature? Why, why, why does this sign affect oh. things? Do you have some sort of Bochner formula? Also, oh, no. So essentially, uh, the way the way you cook up the SPN plus one structure on the total space uses a connection. So it uses a connection of the cotton scalar manifold. Mm -hmm. Now, 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 when you differentiate, once you cook up your your SPN plus one structure and you differentiate the structure equation, you'll see the curvature term just pops up. And if okay. you are positive, then it works out. If it's negative, it I mean, it does work out. But the problem is that the metric that you get is not a Riemannian metric anymore. It's still a Riemannian. So that, that's what happens. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's what goes on. Yeah. So so it does work with negative scalar curvature, but then you don't get positive definite metric. It's negative. It's, yeah. It's mixed signature. Yeah. All right. Thanks. That's fine. Cool. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to somehow follow a similar sort of idea, but now I want to start with a high particular manifold instead of a cotton killer manifold. Okay. So I, I'm going to repeat the same sort of trick, but now I'm going to start with a high particular manifold. Now, suppose I give you a high particular manifold, and here's your high particular triple, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. And then these are closed two forms. So this is defined core module class in H2 with real coefficient. Now, let's suppose for the time being that, uh, in fact, it defines integral core module classes. So, i.e., you can replace the R factor here by the uh, modulo factors of 2 pi. Uh, then, you know, uh, standard algebraic topology tells you that you know, this is, in fact, the classifying space of S1 bundles over your base space. So, what I'm telling you is that using your if your hypercular triple defines integral comedy clause, then you have naturally a T3 bundle over your hypercular manifold, and you can choose connection one forms, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, on the spaces whose curvature is exactly the hypercular triple. Okay, so what I've done is I've cooked up a T3 bundle over my hypercular manifold. Now, what I can do is I can just take the product now or with, when, with, with an R factor. Now I have essentially a rank four vector bundle because if you, if you just take the universal cover of this, you just get R3, and then I'm crossing that with an R factor. So essentially, this is a, an R4 bundle, a rank four vector bundle over a hypercular manifold. And this space has naturally an SPN plus one structure that you can define just the same way Swan does. So what you can do is you can re you can take the hypercular triple from the base, you can rescale that by some function at square, t here being the coordinate on this factor here, and you can rescale the fiber direction by this function bt, bt square here. Okay, so I'm rescaling the direction of this R3 factor here by the function b and rescaling the the, the metric on the base space here. By this function a. Again, you can write down the the cotton killer equation. So this is the first order PD in general. But in this case, everything just depends on one function t. So it's just you just get a, a first order OD system, and you can just solve that. And here's a solution to the system. Okay. So I, I just basically copied off the same sort of strategy that Swan did, but now sort of a high killer one. So Here's the theorem. The theorem is that the metric given by the following expression here is a quaternion killer metric. So here, here's the, your function b, bt square. Here's your function at square here. So this is a, is a complete uh, quaternion killer metric. Uh, it's complete because you can see there's no singularity. So it's well defined for any values of t. And uh, moreover, uh, you can check that, in fact, the Nienheis high tensor of the underlying almost complex structure, in fact, vanishes. So this is, in fact, a hypercomplex manifold. So it's a quaternion killer manifold, which is also hypercomplex. So remember that, in general, a quaternion killer manifold need not be hypercomplex. So this is a very special class of, of quaternion killer metrics. Okay? And the fact that uh, this is a hypercomplex manifold is not very surprising, because by construction, this metric here is T3 invariant, so by, by which I mean it has three killing vector fields. And there's this, there's this general fact about cutting killer manifolds is that killing vector fields are, on cutting killer manifolds are in one-to-one -one correspondence with complex structures on the spaces. On, on, on it. Okay. Uh, okay. Moreover, 
what you can show is that if you take the S1 quotient of this metric, so this metric is differ invariant, so there's a free torus action. So you can take an S1 quotient of that and get rid of this one of this factor. Then the Riemannian submersion, you get a metric on the base, and it turns out that the base metric is also an Einstein metric. Now, there's another T2, 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 T2 action remaining. So you take another S1 quotient, you get another Einstein metric with negative scale curvature, and one more, you get in as, again another Einstein metric. So you get a triple of Einstein metric each time you take an S1 quotient. Okay. And moreover, the metrics that occurs in dimension, uh, so this is a manifold of dimension 4 and plus 4, and each time the dimension goes down by 1, this one's a manifold of dimension 4 and plus 2. This turns out to, in fact, be a k Einstein metric, okay, with negative scalar curvature. And here's a basic example. If you start with a flat space, so just R4, so this is trivially hyperkiller manifold. So holonomy here is, in fact, trivial. And if you plug in that construction, then the metric that you get over here turns out to be the, the hyperbolic quaternic metric. Okay, so this has full holonomy SP and SP1. Sorry, L, P, and Q are just labels, right? They don't mean anything. Oh, uh, no. Well, well, I mean, yes, these, these are just the name of the underlying manifolds, but I'm okay. not going to use that. So that's fine. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now uh, you might wonder at this point, how does one produce complete examples from this, from this construction? Because earlier, to make the proof work, there's only one assumption that I really needed. All I really needed was that uh, my hyperkiller triple define integral commerce clause. So you might wonder how often does that happen? Is there a systematic way of finding such example? So I want to tell you about one way of producing such examples in, in dimension eight. So if you want to produce quaternion killer metrics in dimension eight, you have to start with hyperkiller manifold of dimension four. And this very neat way of producing hyperkiller manifolds in dimension four, namely using the gibbons or Kianza. So what the gibbons work that says is that if, I, if you start with an open set in R3 with the flat Euclidean metric and you pick a positive harmonic function on this open set, then you know that the, this two form here is going to be closed form. If you assume that it defines integral commodity class, then it has there's an S1, then this classifies an S1 bundle over you over, over this open set in R3. And on this S1 bundle, you can define by the following expression here a, a, a hyperkiller metric. Okay, so this is what the given so kind that says. Uh, moreover, it is known that if you take your harmonic function to be of the following form, so if you take it to be some constant, let's say CR divided by this thing here, sorry. where C is some constant, let's say some, some positive integer here. And P's are some points in R3. X is the X is the coordinate in R3. Then you get a complete metric of ALE type. Okay, so so th this produces complete hyperkiller metric. Okay, and for instance, the flat metric occurs when you can take C here to be one, and and P is just the origin, just a single. So if you, so the picture is like this. So you have your R3 here. You have your points P, P1, let's say P2, P3, etc., And you have your total space M4, which is an S1 bundle over V. So over every single point, which is not one of these PIs, you get a circle. And over the P's, turns out you can compact, you can uh, remove the singularity because apparently there's a singularity in this function V here. At, at, at the point piece, but turns out that in fact it's just a coordinate singularity in the metric on the total space. When you can and you can smoothly extend the metric by adding in a point, by fixing a point inside the total space. Okay. So now if you connect, let's say you you pick all the points to be on a straight line in the base space. Okay, they're all in a straight line. Then you can look at line segments connecting any two consecutive points. And if you look at the length of that to the total space, then you get a sphere of negative self, self intersection number. Okay, so here as well, you get a sphere in your total space. And it turns out that these spheres generate the second homology of your spaces, of your hyperkiller manifold. And the condition that your hyperkiller triple defines the integral commodity classes. 
turns out to be equivalent to asking that the distance between these poles in the base space is an integer. Is an integer. So what I'm saying is that if you pick points on a straight line at integer distance from each other, then you can produce a hypercalar metric whose hypercalar triple will define integral cohomology classes, and then you can plug in this construction here and give and, and produce complete examples of quadrangular metric. Okay, so there are lots of examples that you can produce simply by choosing points. Okay. Any questions? Okay. No? Okay. Good. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me go back to the analogy with the Swan construction at this point. So in, in Swan case and our case, what we started, we started with some math some as a quadrant killer manifold, since so the Swan case. We started with a quadrant killer metric, G and plus, let's, let me put it this way. And let me rewrite that. So you started with some function dr square here on the radial coordinate. We made an answer of the following way. So remember, we start with a positive scalar curve to quadrant killer metric, which I'm denoting here by by G n plus, and it has fiber R4, which was essentially you know, R plus cross S3. And then you rescale the size of each of these things by some function B here and some function A here, which is of, this, of the radial coordinate, of the geodesic coordinate. And he solved for the four form being covariant constant. And the answer was that uh, it, it was a, well, the hypercalar metric that Swan produces is a uh, Conical one, so A R is equal to B R is equal to R. This is a conical metric. Whereas in our case, uh, what we did, we did the same thing, and the metric that we produced was D T square, something like four e to the four T, G of T three plus e to the two T G of M. Let me write write it as G H K. So this was the metric that we produced. On, on this total space n. Now, if you look at the fiber metric, in the Swan case, the fiber metric is what? Well, the fiber, this is the fiber, the fiber is an R4. And in our case, the fiber is also an R4. Well, if you go to the universal cover, the fiber is, is, is an R4. The metric, the, the fiber-wise metric in the hypercalar case turns out just to be the flat metric. You know, so if you, there's a picture, so you have your, positive quadrant killer metric here, you have your fiber. R4 here, the fiber-wise metric is just a flat metric on R4. Whereas in our case, if you look at the fiber-wise metric, so you fix the point over your high, or in your high, in your high killer manifold, and you look at the fiber R4, you look at the restricted metric, the metric is a hyperbolic metric. Hyperbolic metric. On, on, on just R4. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm going for right now is telling you that, in fact, you can think of the Swan construction essentially as taking a product of a cutting killer, positive cutting killer metric with R4, and then you twist it in the right way using the flat metric. Whereas in our case, what we do, we take the product of the hypercalar metric on, well, you take the hypercalar manifold, cross it with R, and put the hyperbolic metric on the fiber, and then twist it in the right way to get a negative scalar curvature cutting killer metric. So there's a certain sort of algae between what we're doing. We are somehow gluing in a model metric to our base space and twisting it to the right way using the connection forms. Okay, so there's a certain algae between these two things. So if you know anything about the Swan bundle, you know that it has a lot of sort of symmetries, which makes it very sort of interesting. I'm going to get back into that in a minute. And I claim that every properties of the Swan space is going to have an analog in our case for this metric on, on, on our total space G our total space n here, okay? So let me tell you what are the properties I'm really talking about, okay? So just like in symplectic and hypercalar geometry, you have the notion of a reduction. So if you have a hypercalar manifold with a triathlomorphic S1 action or a symplectic manifold with a Hamiltonian action, you can take a, a hypercalar reduction or, quite, or symplectic reduction. The same is true in quadrangular geometry. This notion of, of quadrangular reduction introduced by as a work of Galicke and Lawson. So here's the simplest 
example of it, suppose we start with a cutting killer manifold with a killing vector field X, preserving the full form, then the, then the proof that there's a unique moment map given by essentially a two form on, on, your, on your space, which values inside this rec free vector bundle generated by omega one omega, omega three, such that when you when you differentiate this two form, you get a free form, which is precisely the contraction of the killing vector field with the four form. Then you can look at the level set, the zero level set of this moment map, and you take the S1 quotient of the space, and whatever you're going to get, you're going to get a cutting killer or before, well, manifold if, you, if there's no, if the action is free. If the action has, is not free, then you will probably get an O before. Okay? So just to make sure that everyone gets what I'm talking about, if this was, if you were doing symplectic geometry, you would replace X here by Hamiltonian vector field. You replace your cutting killer manifold by symplectic one, just by your symplectic form, then the moment map would really just be your Hamiltonian function. And the, this condition here is precisely that if you differentiate your Hamiltonian, your Hamiltonian, you're gonna get the vector field contracted with the symplectic form. And this is whatever you will get. This is the analog of your symplectic reduced space. Okay, so there's a formal analogy between these two things. Okay. Any questions or anything about this? I think it's great. The, the analogy is completely clear. And now, now that you've explained it, it's completely clear. Okay. Okay, uh, so one thing I should say is more generally, I mean, more generally, you don't, you don't necessarily just have one kind of vector. In general, you can have a full group action, and then you're going to have to twist, you have to take the, you have to tensor this by the, by the Lie group, you know, by the Lie algebra of your Lie group. But in this case, I'm just going to stick with when you just have an, as an S1 action or an R action. So I'm just taking the tensor product with R. So that, that's, that's the simplest case we're going to consider today. Okay. So now I want to get into compatibility between the hyperkiller and cutting killer reduction. So, so what do I mean by that? Now, in the previous, by the theorem, what, what you do is you start with a hyperkiller manifold, M4, and using the theorem, you build a cutting killer manifold out of that, or four dimension higher. Okay, using the theorem. Now, let's suppose that on your hyperkiller manifold, you had some killing vector fields. Let's say you had an S1 action over the space generated by some vector field X which was triholomorphic. So it preserved the hypercular triple on the hypercular manifold. And then you could just take the hypercular quotient of the space. And if you do that, you will get some manifold of four dimension less, which is also hypercular. Love? Yes. When you say triholomorphic, is this exactly the same as what Verbitsky calls uh, 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 hyperholomorphic? Uh, Probably yes. Cool. Probably, okay. probably yeah. Probably yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a triholomorphic action, so an action that preserves your hypercular triple, then you can take your hypercular quotient, and you produce another hypercular manifold. Now, using this hypercular manifold, you can again apply your theorem to it, and produce another cotonicular manifold of negative scalar curvature. Now. Okay. So. You might wonder, well, what is the relation between these two objects here? Because both are cutting killer manifolds with negative scalar curvature. Well, it turns out that you can lift your killing vector field from the base to your total space. It's the obvious lift in, in, in a way, but I'm not going to say exactly what it is. But you can just lift your, ve your trihomorphic vector field from your hyperkiller manifold to your cutting killer manifold. And this vector field is now going to preserve your cutting killer structure. So this lifted vector field here is going to preserve your cutting killer full form. So now you can take quadrangular reduction. And if you do take your quadrangular reduction as a lifted action, you get the, the, quadrangular, the other quadrangular manifold, which arises from the theorem. So what this says is that the theorem is compatible uh, with the hypercular quotient of the base space and the quadrangular quotient of the total space. Okay, so let me just release this thing. Over here, and this the fact that this is compatible is also true in the in the Swan case. So I, I made earlier a point that you know there's a certain analogy between the constructions that we that I just described and the Swan construction. 
if you started with a positive scalar curvature particular manifold and look at its swarm space, this is a hypercalar manifold, then swarm, swarm showed that if you if you have a, a killing action on the quaternion killer manifold, you could take the quaternion killer reduction. And the space that you're going to get, you can also look at its swarm space. It's one bundle. Both of these are high pillar manifold, and this arrow here is exactly the high pillar quotient of the swan space by by the, by lifted S1 action. Okay, so this is saying that there's a formal algebra between these two things if you replace HK by QK everywhere. Okay. Now, one thing you should remember about the swan space is that it is a cone. It is a cone over something. So the fiber essentially is R plus cross S3, whereas S3 is essentially, you know, you should think of it as SP1. So this SP1 acts uh, trihalomorphically. But there's also this R factor here. So there's this radial direction here. So there's a homothetic killing action on your swan space. OK, so you might wonder, where does this homothetic action kind of, what, what is the translation of this homothetic action in, the, in, in, in our construction? So, so because if there's a form on RG, everything here should correspond to something here. So what, what is somehow the, the RG? So here's what it is. Suppose you started with a hypercalar manifold with a homothetic killing action. Okay, so by homothetic killing action, I mean a vector field which rescales your hypercalar triple. So, so, so what, okay, so there's this constant here, minus two, which I've just chosen just for convenience, but you can absorb this constant in, in, into the definition of x. Okay, So this is just a vector field that rescales by constant your hypercalar triple, and hence your symmetric as well. Then you can consider a lift of this homothetic vector field to your total space. Okay, So you start with your hypercalar manifold, and the theorem produces a quadrangular manifold over, over it. And if you have a homothetic vector field over on your base space, you can lift that via the following expression here to the total space. So what's what? So this is your vector field, the, your lifted homothetic vector field from the base space. DT here is uh, coordinate on this R, on this R direction. Remember this guy here was locally just an R cross T3 bundle over your happy killer manifold. And uh, Y1, Y2, Y3 here is vertical, is a vertical vector field on this T3. Direction. Okay, so y1, y2, y3 are local coordinates on this on this t3. Okay. And this turns out that this vector field here, which I've just defined, is a killing vector field on the total space and preserves the quaternion killer fourfold. So this means that you can take a quaternion killer reduction again. So let me just illustrate that with an example. So what I'm saying is that let's say you start with R4. Now R4 has a homothetic killing vector field coming from the Euler vector field. Okay, so R cross D. Now, earlier I told you from the theorem, if you apply the construction, then you're going to get the hyperbolic uh, cutting space. So this is SP21, SP2, SP1. It's a cutting kilo manifold. Then if you, if you take this as X, you can lift it by X triddle here, and you're going to get a killing vector field on the space here. So you can take the cutting kilo quotient by this lifted vector field, and it turns out what you get is you get the hyperbolic metric of one dimension less. So this is SP11. So, so the point being that starting from a homothetic killing vector field on the hypercalar manifold, I can produce out of this an Einstein metric of negative scalar curvature on different space. So this, you can apply this construction more generally to any free Sasakian space. So remember, a free Sasakian manifold is a metric whose cone is hypercalar. So in concrete terms, this means that there is a vertical space generated by free vector field, so equivalently free one forms, whose, which, whose, di whose differential satisfy a certain condition. So essentially, it behaves like the structure equation of S3 plus some, plus it produces a triple of uh, two form, which, which gives an SPN plus one structure on the complement of the of the vertical space. And the hypercalar cone structure is given and the hypercalar structure is given by the following expression here. So the sort of thing you should think of is S7. If you start with S7, then the cone is a flat metric on R8. And the conical metric is really you can think of this as 
the metric on S3, and this guy here are the metric on S4. So this is a code over, over S7. Okay, so this is a prototypical example of a precise target manifold. Now, there's a natural homophatic killing vector field now coming from, from this other direction. So if you apply the previous construction, you, so you do the hypercalor quotient, it turns out that you obtain the following metric here. And this is a cutting killer metric with negative scalar curvature, starting from a, on, a, on a free second manifold. OK, so this is a very nice expression. And it has a conical singularity. You'll notice this has a conical singularity. Uh, at y is equal to zero, except when you are a sphere. When you're a sphere, this extends smoothly, and you get the hyperbolic metric, as I said before. Okay, uh, but more generally, the construction does not only apply to uh, Euler vector fields. So this is an Euler vector field. There are also examples of non-conical uh, hypercalar metrics where you can apply this construction to. For instance, if you use a given swapping ansatz with the harmonic function x1, for instance, so just one of the coordinates, then you produce the following incomplete hypercalar metric, uh, but the, it has a homothetic killing action generated by this vector field here, and so you can apply the previous uh, construction to produce a cotton killer manifold out of this. But uh, it's very diff difficult to actually extract, extract the metric explicitly, because this, is, is this vector field in particular is not a gradient vector field. Instead, but in this case, it was which made life a bit easier. Okay. Okay. Any question about this example? I think we're good. Okay. Cool. Okay. So now, on a hypercalar manifold, there's another type of killing vector fields that can exist aside from a triangular one. So whenever you have a hypercalar manifold and I give you a killing vector field on your space, it can be one of two types. It can either be triangular so it preserves your hypercalar triple. Or it can be permuting. So what does permuting mean? Permuting means that it preserves one of your symplectic form, but it rotates the other two around. Okay, so this means that it so a vector field preserving one of the symplectic form, but rotating the other two around. And the sort of prototypical example you should think of is again R4. Think of R4 R C2. Now this is this has a flat hypercalar structure. So let's say sigma one being one of them is essentially given. So let's pick complex coordinate here, z1, z2. So I distinguish one of the complex structure. Now you can, the symplectic form will essentially be given by tz1, which tz1 ball, plus tz2, which tz2 ball. Why okay. do you normalize by, why do you normalize by two? It gives me the impression that if you flow, then you exponentially uh, stretch these guys. Why, why, why two? Why two? I'd be much happier if the two weren't there. Well, I mean, you could absorb it into into the vector field, but uh, uh, why would you use the two? I mean, I mean, in, I mean, in principle, I mean, in principle, you could just redefine the vector field here and just absorb the definition. But then you'll have to modify something else to get to get the yeah. right thing. Yeah, I, I'm going to explain. I see a log coming up, so just and I mean, just go ahead, and then I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll be quiet. Okay, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, no, the problem is that I've chosen my, my there's some constant that I fixed earlier, you know, because there was some fractions that when you solve, really what happened was that when I solve this, I don't say that, but when you apply the construction and you solve it, there's some constants that arise in this case, and I fix a constant to be something. And, 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 and because I fixed that constant here, that's why I have to fix the other constant as well. So that's basically what going, because there's, there's some constant factors that could arise over here as well. So if you get, if I could make the other, the vector field one, change the con constant over there to be one if I change the factor here. But then I'll have to carry fractions in the, in the metric, which is what I didn't want to do, that's why. Yeah, you, I, you see, but that, that's kind of my point. Uh, it, you, uh, of course you can sort of algebraically just absorb it into X, but the yeah. qualitative behavior is different, right? Because this governs some sort of rate of growth, right? So, so this is, Right, there's exponentials of things along uh, 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 at some, I, 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 I think this, the two is, is not just some normalizing constant, it's some rate of growth of something. And, you know, as soon as there's a log at play, and there will be. Yeah, you think, uh, okay. I don't know, yeah, just, but sure, yeah. Okay, maybe I didn't think about it hard enough, I just 
say, okay, that's a constant that make it work. So, all right. Okay, so yeah, so I was giving you uh, an example of a permitting action on just this flat space. So if you start with R4, you think of that as C2, you distinguish a complex structure, so, and you pick complex coordinate Z1 and Z2, you can define the one of the symplectic form to be the following one. Maybe you have to divide by two pi, uh, two i or something like that. But let's just ignore that. Then sigma two plus i sigma three, you can take that to be dz1, which dz2. So this is your holomorphic symplectic form. Then you see that if you act by diagonal action of u1, so you act by e to the i theta diagonally, then this guy here and this guy here remain invariant. Whereas this one gets multiplied by a factor e to the i two theta. So this is the sort of, of, of example I, I'm talking of, of permitting action. So it preserves one of the complex, one of the Kahler form, but it rotates the other two around. So it's preserving the complex structure, but it's rotating your your, your choice of a of a holomorphic symplectic structure. So that, 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 that's what's going on right now. Okay. Then you can lift this vector field here. So this is a killing vector field. You can lift that vector field to your total space. And I claim that if you choose the lift to be the following vector field here, then you get a killing vector field. This becomes a killing vector field on N, preserving the full form. So let me, I mean, the expression itself doesn't matter, but let me tell you what's what. So this is the lift of the vector field from the base. This is uh, the vertical vector field coming from the two torus action. So this is a two torus that, that you're rotating by. So this corresponds to the connections associated to these two Kähler forms, which, are, which I'm rotating by. And I have a freedom to add in uh, an S1 vertical vector field coming from the other action, from, from, the, from the last S1, because for the T3 bundle, so one of the T2 is fixed, but you have a constant freedom. You have a freedom to change the last killing vector field by some constant factor. Can just drop something there. Then you can just work out what the quaternion killer moment map is for this killing vector field, and it turns out to be given by the following, following set here. So this is the set of values where uh, y2 is equal to y3 is zero. So you're getting rid of this t2 bundle here, and the function in the r direction, uh, the t has to be a function on m4. So this, so a here is a constant. This contraction here, this is the vectorial x contracted with kappa 1, where kappa 1 is a primitive of your symplectic form. So the point being, so, so I mean, the expression in itself doesn't matter, but what is important is that this level set, this is the zero section, so the level, the primitive of the zero section is essentially the S1 bundle corresponding to the Kähler form sigma 1. Okay, so this is a good dimension 3 submanifold inside your cutting killer manifold. Now there's a S1 action in space generated by the specter field x fiddle here, which preserves the induced metric uh, as a submanifold. And if you take the Riemannian quotient, so the Riemann submersion, then you, you get a cutting killer metric. So this is, this is simply the, the cutting killer reduction. Okay, so what I'm saying is that starting from a happy killer manifold, with a permitting vector field x, you can lift it to your quaternion killer space. You look at the moment map of the space, you get some good dimension free submanifold. You can take the Riemannian quotient of that, and you can produce a quaternion killer metric of negative scalar curvature. Okay, so this is negative scalar curvature, quaternion killer metric. Okay, so here's an example of this. You start with R4, again, with a flat space. Uh, now I'll take my killing vector field, my permitting killing vector field, to be rotation on x3 and x4. So I think of R4 here as being, you know, two copies of R2, coordinate x1, x, x1, y1 here, x1, x2, x3, x4, and I'm just rotating by u1 here. So this preserves, if you look at this here, this clearly is acting trivially on this bit here, it's rotating this thing, but this is invariant. So again, over here, I'll get a multiplication by factor e psi theta. Okay, so this is again a permitting action. And if you take the, you apply the construction, you take the quaternion killer reduction, here's the metric that you get on the quotient space, you get the following quaternion killer metric. Uh, in dimension four, quaternion killer metrics are called self-dual Feinstein manifolds. And this is uh, the, the metric that you get. 
out of it. Okay, and you see that the constant a arises here and gives you one parameter family of quadrant killer metric. And the important thing to notice here is that this space is this metric here is is actually a complete metric, and topologically it is a total, it is a nil manifold. So you can easily see that from the fact that uh, dx1, dx2 here is, is, is a closed one forms. This one here is a closed one form as well. So this corresponds to the exterior derivative of, the, of this triple. And if you take exterior derivative of this one form here, you get dx1 wedge dx2. So you realize that the structure equation is exactly the structure equation of, of, the, Neumann, of the Heisenberg group cross R. So you can think of this, or otherwise you can also think of it as a commodity to one metric with a principal orbit being the Heisenberg uh, group. Now, when E is equal to zero, uh, this metric reduces to the complex hyperbolic metric. And otherwise, it is uh, a genuinely distinct. Like, otherwise, if A is not zero, then this is some cutting killer metric, which is not killer in particular. OK? And the key observation from this construction is that uh, there's, in fact, a killing vector field on this on the, on the quotient space corresponding essentially to this direction here, which corresponds to the push forward of the S1 action on the total space. So let me go back here and say that a bit more precisely because I haven't said that well at all. So starting from my hyperkiller manifold, I produce a level set inside my cutting killer manifolds, which is an S1 bundle. Now on this space, there's two S1 actions. There's an S1 action generated by this by, the, by, by, by one of the S1 action coming from the dy1 direction. And there's also the lifted permitting click vector field acting on the space. And these two actions commute with each other. And if I take the Riemannian submersion with respect to this S1 action, then I produce a cutting killer metric on one side. And, what I, and because these two actions commute, this vector field here, this S1 action, is going to descend to an S1 action here. So I end up getting a cutting killer manifold with a certain killing vector field. We have a certain killing, killing vector field here. So the point being that I've started with a high killer manifold with a certain killing vector field, and I've produced out of this pair a cutting killer manifold with a different killing vector field. Okay. Now you might wonder, can I go the other way around? If I if I were given a cutting killer manifold with certain killing vector field, could I have reproduced the hyperkiller manifold to begin with with another stable killing vector field? And the answer to that turns out to be yes. So, so the theorem says that, in fact, starting from a cutting killer manifold with stable killing vector field, I'm not going to say what stable mean, but you can invert this construction and reproduce a hyperkiller metric. So the proof was really motivated by work of Hades, whereby he shows uh, what is known today as hyperkiller cutting killer correspondence. So in the Swan case, Swan shows if you start with a cutting killer manifold, positive scalar curvature, you can produce the Swan bundle. And if you have a killing vector field on the cutting killer manifold, you can lift that to a triholomorphic S1 action on your total space. And you can take the hyperkiller quotient and produce a hyperkiller manifold out of that. And Hades, uh, in, 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 in his thesis, he proves that, in fact, you can actually reverse this construction. You can construct uh, uh, hyperholomorphic. So uh, probably this is what Henrique was saying about earlier. Uh, starting from a hyperkiller manifold, you can produce with with certain special sort of killing S1 action. You can produce a hyperholomorphic line bundle over it. And if you take a quotient, you can actually invert this construction to reproduce a cotton, to reproduce the original cotton killer manifold. And this was this was work of Hades thereby setting up a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sphere, so a cutting killer manifold and an S1 action, and on the other hand, another high killer manifold with a distinguished, with another sort of S1 action. And what, I, what I've just shown to you, what I'm just claiming right now, is that starting from high killer manifold with a permitting S1 action, you can actually lift, you can actually lift it to the space which I've just described before from the theorem. You can lift this S1 action here, and if you take the cutting killer reduction with this, you can produce a negative scalar curve to a particular manifold, thereby setting up a one-to-one -one correspondence between all this triple. So starting from a happy killer manifold with a permitting action, you can create both a positive scalar curve to a particular metric and a negative scalar curve to one. 
Okay. So this, this is this is the theorem. I probably won't say anything about the proof because it's because I haven't told you enough about how the construction really works. But here's the sort of similarities that you can see again between the Swan bundle and the manifold, the current killer manifold N here again. Any question about this? I think we may have to we may have to uh, leave further details for the questions if that's okay because we're a little okay. bit of oh we are well, well, are we out of time or yeah a bit uh, but oh, that's okay. it uh, okay do you, do you have any more any do you have a lot more uh no no I, I think I can finish here otherwise I'll, I might go a bit too much. All right. Sorry, so, I, I, I didn't quite realize how false. I, yeah, I, I think I went slower than expected. Yeah. So for the time, I interrupted you thirteen times, so it's okay. Uh, let's thank the speaker for the time being. <laughs> and then we, we we can take a few more questions if that. Sure. Thank you. Do people have questions? Mm -hmm. I think this relates to from various directions to what several people here mm -hmm. study. So once you're around, we're gonna have uh, you have some specific conversations with. Yeah. Oh. Ariane, do you have a question? I would like to know only a little bit about the balanced metrics that you promised in the first oh. slide. Is it okay. too long? No, 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 not at all. So. So yeah, so earlier I said that you know on, on these uh, these manifolds that I've constructed, in fact, are hyper complex manifolds. They're not just quite killer manifolds; they're in fact hyper complex. Yeah. So you could ask about, well, can I modify the metric to find a balanced metric on these spaces? So it turns out you can actually make a conformal rescaling of this quite killer metric to, in fact, produce balanced metric on these spaces. It's so, balanced with respect to all the complex structures. Exactly. Yeah. It's balanced with respect to all, all the triples. So it's somehow a hyperbalanced metric in a way. But these examples are non compact, but you can also produce compact examples. So, okay. so, so let, let me just say very quickly what was your. So now, if you start with a hyperkiller manifold, you have the space of two forms is going to split as a holonomy algebra, you know, the sp1 bit and the spn bit, and then the perpendicular bit, right? And so yeah. far, what I've said, the, the way I've cooked up this manifold N was by taking the hypercular triple and looking at the inter if they define integral commutative clauses, I cook up a T3 bundle, then cross that with all. But now instead, if you look at the SPN factor instead, this can also have integral commutative clauses. So you can look at also S1 bundles generated by these uh, by, by these commutative clauses. Mm -hmm. And it turns out on this, if you pick the right bundles, if you pick the right S1 bundle, you can produce a T3 invariant hyperbalanced metric on this basis as well. That's a very sort of simple way of producing balanced metric. And uh, yeah, and this, this was some, some a special case of that was somehow studied by work of Anna and Isabel. Oh, OK, oh. they're only manifolds, OK. Yeah, they're only manifold. Well, it's the only manifold if you started with T4, because if you started with, with, with a flat metric, then you have the full full on symmetry. But okay. otherwise, you can just use any hard killer mine. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. Um, any yep. more questions? If not, then I, then I may have. Okay. Yes. Go for it. So do you think? Do you think? Um, so so here's one thing that occurs to me. Uh, yep. um, thinking about eight manifolds, right? So the, the situation on eight manifolds, mm -hmm. it would make sense to ask what flows of g2 structures would give you um especially if the seven mm -hmm. manifold is maybe three sazakian it would yeah. it would make sense to ask which geometric flows of g2 structures will give you uh uh uh, uh your, your hypercalar or cotillion cave structure on um on um on, on on the eight manifold on the cylinder itself right yeah. For instance, there are, you know, people construct Calabi-Yau structures on the eight-dimensional cylinder associated to the Laplacian flow. So, right, so that that you 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 can you can write certain or the co-flow rather, right? So so there are situations in which the flow of 
a seven dimension of a structure on a seven dimensional manifold produces an interesting structure on the eight dimensional cylinder incomplete okay. of course right incomplete but uh, still non-trivial okay so, so is it is it like like evolution like evol evolving like hippo structure is that what we're saying i, I wonder if, you, if, if you've ever considered whether a, a flow of structures on a seven manifold can produce yeah. your type of matrix mm. on the eight manifold oh okay okay i believe Yeah, probably there's some notion of hippo structures on quaternion scalar manifold. I guess that you could just you start with hypersurface in there, and then you evolve a certain structure on that to get mm -hmm. a quaternion scalar manifold. Yeah, I believe that that could be possible. Yes. Yeah. Just, just, just like in a G, like, just like in a G two case, you start with a half flat SU three structure that evolves that to get a G two manifold or something like that. Yeah, I Amazing. believe. Yeah, I Good. believe. Yeah, something, something like that could be possible. So I'm gonna have a look at that. Yep. Second, uh, uh, your in integrability conditions are always too strong, right? So asking that omega be uh, parallel. Integral. Be, yeah, well, it's a omega, you ask omega, big omega to be parallel, right? Yes, that's right, yeah. Right. Uh, there may be a weaker notion of uh, uh, harmonic quaternionic Yes, trailers. that's right. Uh, so you could just ask that the four form is closed. So I, I think that was... So I, I think when 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 Swan first uh, proves that you know in dimension eight you need both conditions you need that the four form is closed but also that this ideal is kind of like you know, an algebraic ideal like it wasn't right. known whether this was an actual you no know, condition that is actually needed and I think Simon Simon produced the first example where you can be closed but you don't have to be cut and kilo and I think uh, and go, that's harmonicity that that that's the harmonicity condition yes exactly so so so, so because the four form is, is self dual so it's, so if it's closed it's automatically harmonic so ah. there are examples yeah. And I think Diego Conti and Thomas Madsen also produce a lot of examples that are closed, but were not cut in kilo. So this satisfies these weaker notions. That's right. So yeah. you, you know we have some technology to study the harmonic flow of these structures now. So it would be interesting to look at flow lines connecting. This is uh, different. Some, yeah, okay. Yeah, they emerge as critical points of some harmonic map energy. And therefore, there should be gradient lines from one to the other. And therefore, in some cases, we could look at you know decide if they're stable or unstable critical points there's some interesting oh. uh, study we could do there uh you know in your time in france make sure you explain this to eric and he'll he'll, okay. he'll ask the same question automatically okay uh and la last but not least what yes. about quaternionic kaler instantons oh uh i mean i i mean in general i, I think as far as i know people have studied those in the positive positive scalar curvature case but uh -huh. i think in, in that case essentially essentially what people do is that you know if your manifold has positive scalar curvature then you you have your twister space that goes with it and you and, and basically what they do they pull back the instant equation from the base space to the twister space and then they just look at holomorphic geometry on your twister space so you know, they just convert the problem of instanton into twister theory and then they just do i don't know algebraic geometry to kind of like and you can do this in dimension 4n or just in dimension 4? I believe in any dimension. But I, as far as I know, this has been done only in the positive scalar curvature case. In the oh. negative one, I don't think so. As far as I know. Yeah. 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 OK, so those yeah. are the three things we're going to do over the next four years. I hope you, <laughs> I hope oh, you have okay. an answer in three weeks' time. That, yeah. OK, that's a bit. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. No, yeah, one, one, one thing. Okay, so the last slide. So, so okay. Oh, oh, okay, so because this might be interesting to you, um, because on these bundles over hypercular manifolds, you can also ask, you can also ask, are there G two metrics, are there KBR metrics on this big, or, or are uh -huh. there okay. metrics? And it turns out they're all. So this, this was shown by work of Gibbons and, and collaborators. So in the physics literature, they prove that you know, if you change the rescaling, this functions a and b is what I said earlier. You can actually produce G two and Smith seven metrics on these spaces. And later on, it was Apostrophe and Simons that realized that you know, in fact, you can put those inside a wider context of uh, S one invariant uh, G two metrics, which admit Kähler reduction. So you know, this is a, there's also the picture from the other special homomorphic side as well. Very cool. 
Yeah. Very nice. All right. Let's thank uh, Udav. It's a very interesting talk. Very, very thought provoking. Uh, we make sure you can visit uh, Cordova and explain the new manifold business closer to Adrian, who's the yeah, yeah, of course, of course. You'll be welcome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, All right. Cool, everyone. Uh, uh, Paul, I think you can stop recording.